Welcome to the Think Podcast with Joel Sedicase. I'm Joel Sedicase, and this is the show that tackles impossible questions from a biblical perspective to help you explain, share, and defend your faith. And in order to defend your faith, it kind of helps to know what your faith is, what your faith believes. And contrary to some popular opinion or mainstream opinion, the Christian faith didn't just uh, drop down from a UFO last year or five years ago, um, but actually has a rich and deep history uh, going back going back millennia, going back um, 2,000 years. And over the last 2,000 years, there have been countless millions of sermons preached. And one of the great difficulties of living in the modern era and yet holding to an ancient faith is this, that the very vast majority of those ancient sermons uh, that have been preached over the last 2,000 years are lost to us. And the reason why I say that's a difficulty, a challenge, is because we we are able to access a lot of those old sermons, but we have to sit down and take the time and actually read. Now, as someone who loves books, loves collecting books, reading books, um, even I have a hard time sitting down and really diving in. I've got a collection of Spurgeon sermons that I uh, get into and try to read from time to time, but it can be really hard to sit down and just read and just read these long form essays, really, which is what a sermon is. And so wouldn't it be cool if there was a way that we could get in touch with the historical roots of our faith, of our religion, of our relationship with the Lord, of the intellectual side of our faith without having to sit down and read. And of course, I'm not ragging on books. I love books, but wouldn't it be nice if we could do that in uh, in our travels, on the road, on our commute? You know, a lot of guys are busy. You're, you're traveling home from work. Uh, you're listening to Joe Rogan, Ben Shapiro, um, Jocko Willink, wouldn't it be great if you could listen to J.C. Ryle, you know, or Charles Spurgeon? I mean, how cool would that be? Well, the guys that I'm interviewing today, uh, Troy Frazier and Joel Bordez, are the guys with the answer. They have created a um, they have created a podcast where they are literally reviving these old sermons that have never been contemporarily recorded. And they are recording, recording them, they are preaching them, and they are bringing them back to life so that you can listen to them. And uh, I want to talk with these guys. I've got, a, I've got a bunch of questions. I want to know all about what they're doing. And um, we're going to talk about the benefits of, of rooting your faith in these historic sermons and bringing them back to life. So without any further ado, Troy and Joel, welcome to the Think Podcast. Hey, we are happy to be here. This is Troy. This is Joel. Yeah, thanks for having us on. We're happy to be here. Absolutely. Well, um, really, really glad to have you guys joining us. And, uh, you know, this is such an interesting idea. And um, I've heard of, I've heard of like Charles Spurgeon, you know, I don't know if you'd call him podcast, but on uh, Sermon Audio, which is this great app you can get. Um, old Spurgeon sermons and stuff like that, but I've never heard of anybody quite doing what you guys are doing, where you're literally going through the old catalogs and reviving these sermons. So could you just tell me, like, how did you get this started? What was your motivation for wanting to do this? Yeah, so this all happened, I would always kind of say a little bit by accident. We had, um, I had picked up a book of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and I thought it was actually a biography, and I was just kind of looking for some light reading. When I took it home, I realized it was a book of his sermons, and I did what probably a lot of listeners and a lot of people would do in that situation. I kind of went, oh, man. And I kind of put it on the shelf. I was like, what a waste. Like, that was not, I don't know how that even happened. What a mistake, right? But eventually, over time, I kind of picked it up and started flipping through it, and there was this one sermon that more than any other stood out to me. It was called The Fear of God, and it was just we, we did this sermon. It's a great sermon. And when I went back to it, I looked at like the little biography right before, you know, that comes right before it in the book. And it said, this was preached on this day, right? Like the Sunday, right after these Nazis had marched through the street of Berlin, got in this huge fight with these communists demanding that Hitler be made the chancellor of Germany. And I thought, whoa, 
could you imagine like a riot like that happening in our capital and then a preacher getting up on Sunday and being like, don't be afraid. What are we afraid of? We got God on our side. Nothing to be afraid of. I feel like if it were me, I'd get up and I'd be like, uh, panic. The country's going down the tubes. It's time to get out of here. And he, he could not have been more calm. And I thought, what a calming presence for those congregants. And that was kind of where we started to realize, like, there's something to this. Yeah, and it kind of took off. It kind of took off from there. At that time, I mean, Troy and I have been good friends for a long time. We met in Bible college in 2011, uh, and we've worked on a lot of different projects over the years. And at that time, Troy was living in China, actually teaching in China. And he called me up one day and he says, "I have an idea for this podcast where we take old sermons and uh, make them, you know, make modern audio recordings that people can listen to." Um, and I, I loved the idea and it kind of developed and, and came from there. And there was a lot of questions too. We had to wrestle with like, do we keep them in their old English or do we update them? Um, what kind of preachers do we do? Is it where we read each episode or not? And we kind of came to some important answers, which is we put it in modern English, make it really easy to listen to. Uh, we have different speakers come on and do each sermon. So when you listen, you just hear this voice you've never heard before come in and speak as that person. So each preacher is really feeling like they're being preached uh, anew. And so it was a lot of fun. It took a year and a half to develop, but we've been blown away with how people have responded to it. So these guys, as they're preaching these sermons, are they preaching to you? Is there, a, is there an audience or a congregation there at all? Or are they, are they preaching to an empty room? It's, it's different for every time. Um, and we have preachers, because again, every episode has someone else preaching for it, because it, it's, it's a neat way to um, kind of have a different voice each week to week. So if you don't like the speaker from one week, next week, you, you know, it might be someone else that you like more. Um, but uh, some of these people are very successful pastors that run churches, and they can record a sermon that they're literally preaching uh, some people are volunteers that are maybe even listeners that have written in wanting to be a part of the show. Uh, we, we love working with all of our audience and, and everyone that's interested. Um, and so sometimes it is just someone in their office recording a sermon that, uh, again, they're reading from uh, that transcript, that manuscript there. So uh, it, it varies from, from sermon to sermon. And it's been pretty incredible to see how God has pulled people from literally all over the world. Our Chrysostom system was from Canada and our Andrew Gray was from uh, limbs in England, but I mean, he himself is Scottish and we've just seen people come over and just email us or message us or radio DJs, just all these different people be like, we want to help bring a sermon back to life. This is, it's just, and it's interesting too watching as like, okay, we have people in certain roles who are starting to kind of become those voices. So this voice that no one's heard from in 200 years, like they're starting to be kind of almost embodied in this. It's really interesting stuff. So will you have the same preacher preach all the sermons by Ryle or all the sermons by Spurgeon or do you have, do you bring in different voices for the same uh, historical? Our, our goal is to get to a place where each person's voice is kind of the same person. And we've been able to do that with a few people. Um, our Jay Gresham Machen, our DL Moody, we do have now a Charles Spurgeon. Um, so they're a JC route. There's certain people that were like, we can count on these people to kind of embody that voice. And it's been really cool to watch how I, I in my mind, I just, I, when I think of Spurgeon, I now can hear this, literally this British person's voice who lives in London. It's, it's a pretty fun thing. Wow, that's, that's incredible. So as you're um, thinking about, you know, whose sermon you want to recreate next, what's that thought process like in terms of how do you choose the preacher, uh, you know, the historical preacher? How do you choose which of his sermons uh, you know, you're going to reproduce. Do current events factor into that at all? Is it, you know, I'm in this kind of mood today. I'd like to hear, you know, Spurgeon or Moody preach about evangelism today. Um, what's that thought process like and, and that decision process? It's going to sound a little selfish, maybe. I kind of just pick things that sound kind of interesting. Like I'll read several different sermons. I'll be going through them. I'm like, oh, this one sounds kind of interesting or unique. And then I go through it and occasionally I'll get to a sermon. I'll go, you know, that one wasn't super hot. I didn't really love that one. Um, and then I'll kind of think about, okay, if I'm an audience member, how well could I follow along with that? But generally speaking, I just click through, I read it and I go, wow, that was a lot. I learned a whole lot from that. That's really interesting. We don't really get into um, 
to current events a whole lot because the 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 lot it takes months to make these episodes to get everyone on board like we produce an episode every thursday you have a new sermon to listen to but that episode was probably started back in september or you know october and it took till now to get to so if we were trying to keep up with anything we wouldn't be able to but the funny thing is i cannot tell you how many times the thing that comes out that week could not be more relevant. I remember there was this big deal about a evangelical pastor leaving the church. And it was the same week we were releasing our John Calvin sermon on false prophets in the church. And it just, it's funny how many times no we'll be posting a sermon like that. And I'm like, well, this week's is really relevant. We'll just kind of let that slide out there and let everyone kind of deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Wow. Was that um, the, the high profile guy who recently, uh, apostatize and you know I'm not yeah a, I think it will and you say that that feel, you could name like five different people right there but sad this one, but true yeah. the one from the summer it was the one and I, I think I can't remember which one it was for sure but it was I remember it was over the summer that happened and like two days later I'm like and here's a sermon about uh wolves in the church so we'll just kind of yeah it sounds like this is supposed to be criticism but again this sermon had been recorded months before oh that's incredible are, are you primarily drawing from the the English speaking world, you know, uh, I mean, I would assume you'd have to, right? Um, but you mentioned Bonhoeffer earlier. Um, are, are you primarily drawing from Western Christianity, from Protestantism, from, you know, do you go back pre Reformation at all? Or um, uh, the, the reason I ask this, Troy, you, you lived in China for a while. I mean, do you guys yes. get into like Brother Lee or uh, Witness, uh, or Witness Lee or Brother? Uh, brother uh there's watchman knee and watchman knee so thank you yeah we yeah. Ha i have a few sermons of theirs that i'm i'm kind of tinkering around with we haven't yet been able to produce them or get it takes again it takes a while um we are totally open to sermons from around the world we have almost exclusively been in the west though just because it's very difficult to find sermons from like the 1700s. I, I cannot tell you how long I've looked for a William Carey sermon and things like that, where I'd like, I'd love to get a sermon from some preacher in that area, but they just, it wasn't written down. It, or maybe it, some of them are stuck, not translated. I mean, there are sermon, you'd be surprised. We have church fathers like uh, Chris Ossistam and, and not Chris Ossistam, sorry, um, Origen and, uh, and John Wycliffe and even John Huss, who we have their sermons and they're still sitting there untranslated, not being worked on. So no one can listen to them. No one can read them. And I just, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting part of history that I think has been highly neglected, especially because you read them. And yeah, it, if you can get, can't get past the old English, the stuff is truth and the truth did not die at all. But we do have a few of the church fathers. We're working on with Origen. We have Chrysostom. We have a St. Augustine that'll be out in like a week or two. And so we do have stuff like that that we're working on. We have a Catholic priest, Johann Tauler, who lived in the 1300s, dealt with the Black Plague, like, for, like right there on the front lines of it. Um, we're trying really hard to fill in that gap from 400 to 1200, because I don't think the church died in that 800 years, but you would think it did with how little there is like to work with. So it can be kind of hard. And then finding stuff outside of the West is also difficult, but we do have, um, we do have German speakers and stuff like that. We're, as we get better at it, our profile is able to expand too. Yeah. That, that, that low middle ages, uh, Augustine to like Wycliffe, uh, yeah. that, that, yeah, that can be challenging. Um, even the English in those days, it, it wasn't, you know, it was like Beowulf's English. It wasn't, yeah, exactly. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't even Shakespeare's English at that point. But it does. Um, one thing I do say, historians do a great job of translating like every tiny old poem they can find from that era. But boy, they've really neglected. I mean, you would think someone like John Huss, we would at least have a sermon or two of his to read. And they just, they're not, nobody's, nobody's done anything with them. That seems so crazy to me because I, I mean, there's so much information out there about Huss and, uh, and, the, the movement and, and you know, the, the Bohemians and how he was a precursor to Luther, you would think that the shelves would be rife with his sermons. People would be, you know, there are still, there are still, um, he still has followers today yeah. who, who are out there. You would think that somebody would have translated him into English. So which, in which case too, and it is, we do occasionally run into sermons that are like sitting in some university, one of our big ones that we're really proud of. And you, Joel, you might jump in on yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. And this actually came as a recommendation from my, from my wife, who is a very talented musician, but she was telling me about uh, this composer that she was researching called, uh, named George Matheson. And she says that there's this story about how he performed this song before the queen and it was 
followed by the sermon that he preached. And that's one thing about a lot of these old pastors that we see very often is that they not only were they great preachers and great leaders of churches, but they were also great musically talented. Like they, they made art, they made music, which is something that we don't really see with modern day pastors. Like you're, you're, you have a different worship pastor that makes the music. But back then, like the, the pastor that led the church was also writing hymns and things along those lines. Um, but she like, said, yeah, there's, yeah. This, there's this guy named George yeah. Matheson who preached this sermon before the queen. And the queen loved it so much that she ordered it to be written down and stored in her personal library. And she said she couldn't find the, the sermon anywhere. And so I said, hey, that's, that's right up our alley. Let me tell Troy about that. Troy, Troy does 99% of the research on this. So he's, he is a wizard when it comes to researching these things, uh, digging down. And he spent weeks digging around trying to find this specific sermon that George Matheson you know, preached. And again, it was so impactful on the queen that, that she had it recorded and, and preserved in a vault. And uh, we couldn't find anywhere. There's a lot of references to it. There's a lot of people mentioning this sermon. There's a lot of people quoting excerpts from the sermon, but no actual transcript of the sermon at all until uh, Troy found a, a connection in George Matheson's hometown over in the UK. There's a library there that, uh, as far as we know, has the only preserved copy of this sermon. And Troy was com you know, communicating back and forth with them, and they, just, they found out that uh, for a few dollars, they would send us uh, some scanned copies of this version. And so we got wow. that and got it recorded and got that episode done. And as far as we know, that is the only audio version of this sermon it's, in existence. It's the only audio version and our post of it online is the only place you can read it. And this was a sermon on the, that was on the patience of Job. And it is incredible. Like it totally reworked my thinking of Job just completely. Wow. So this is a, this is a really important sermon and you guys found it and you said your website is the only place you can read this online unless somebody copied it yeah, from as far our as website. We know. <laughs> you know that's that's incredible because you know there are websites out there like i don't know have you ever heard of the ccel the christian oh, yeah Classics I, use, I use a lot of their library? Stuff. that's where i get a lot of stuff from them sure that's that's amazing to me that you know a website like that wouldn't even have that but you guys got it that's you know well done on that that's pretty Thanks. cool um so what you're describing, you know, these month long processes uh, to create a single episode. Do you guys have day jobs? <laughs> yep, we do. <laughs> we do. It's definitely an adventure. It's a lot of fun. Um, kind of stressful sometimes to put, mm. to put these episodes together. Because again, it, it does require a stupid amount of work. Whenever we were working on producing the first run of these episodes, the first 10 episodes of this, again, it took us a year and a half to develop the first 10 episodes. And that whole time, we were just worried that someone else was going to come out with a show like this and kind of beat us to the punch with it. And after we got done making them, we realized the reason no one else has done this is because it just takes so much, so much work. No one else wants to put this amount of work into it. Um, so, yeah, we both work full time and then do this uh, on the side. So it's a lot of nights of recording. Uh, I, I don't think we've mentioned this yet, but before each sermon in, in our episodes, we do. We take about the first ten minutes, and we go through kind of a, a rough biography of the person speaking, and kind of trying to paint a picture of what was that setting like, what was that audience like that that preacher was speaking to, what was the environment like, what was the political situation like. Um, try to make it feel more real, and kind of set that up. And sometimes, you know, we might spend the whole episode talking about that person's life from start to finish, or we might take that whole uh, intro just talking about a specific day that 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 sermon was preached on what was going on that day, you know, kind of painting that scenario. Um, and so it's, it's a way that we try to make it feel more grounded um, before we actually dive into listening to the sermon itself. And so that portion as well takes research and, and formatting and planning and recording as well. So there's, there's several different aspects that come together to make a, an episode of Revive Thoughts. Okay. Now you guys are both in your late twenties. Um, are, are you married? Do you have wives? We do. Yes. <laughs> Both married. Okay. And your, and your wives are cool with this. They're, they're cool with you yeah. searching. All, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's good. It's he I mean, who find, yeah. he who finds my a wife, wife finds a good thing. My wife was helping me edit a John Calvin sermon the other day. And it's so funny because when I edit them, I always am like constantly like, dude, you got to listen to this quote. I can't believe the way he said this, or I never thought about it this way. And I always thought I was annoying her. And then I was doing the dishes and she was editing it and she was doing the same thing where every five minutes she's like, the way he said this or oh my gosh or 
or also what we say to each other a lot, which is like, my gosh, this sentence runs on and on and on <laughs> forever. It's going to take so long. A to lot of run-on sentences. <laughs> It's funny the the uh, the way people thought back in those days before TV and mm. the internet and Twitter. I mean, just their their train of thought was, you know, t- five ten times longer than what, yeah. what yes. we string together today. Uh, which you see the same thing in scripture too. Yeah. You know, you, if you read the original Greek of Paul, some of these sentences. I mean, you have whole paragraphs that are just a single sentence. Um, what would be one thing that you would want my listeners to understand before we get really get into the benefits of of how what you guys do can really help christians what what's the one thing you want our listeners to understand about what you do in terms of reviving these old sermons the listener probably doesn't realize this but the greatest theologians, maybe some of the greatest thinkers they've ever heard of, like people like Charles Spurgeon and John Calvin and Martin Luther, these important people for both history and also, you know, their books changed the church before they, almost before all of them had ever written a book, they were preaching to a congregation every Sunday faithfully. And that's where their first audience was. And everything they write in these books, they usually tested it through their church. And they also were putting this into words, how to live out your life and how to love God was being preached to those churches. And there is so much truth that is imp- that is compacted in these thoughts and we can listen to it and we can read it and we can come back to it again. And you would think something from the 1500s has nothing to do with you today, but I promise you almost every sermon, multiple times, I just kind of put my head in my hands and go, wow, I had never seen it like that before. You know, I'm a former pastor myself. It's just incredible to imagine somebody caring about something that I wrote down for my little congregation, you know, hundreds of years later. And I was looking at your guys' website. And, I mean, you've you've got sermons from the 19th 19th century, the 18th century. I mean, you, you even mentioned you're trying to fill in the gap between 400 and 1200. So... I mean, there's, there's guys in there from the 1200s, 1300s, just the idea that someone is still caring about the product of their sermon prep, you know, the better part of a millennium later is just mind boggling. And, and, and the idea, well, we're going to get into this later, but the idea that, that it's still relevant to today, um, truly, I don't know if that's inspiring or terrifying, but it's cool. Either well, way. it's something I would tell people we've said on interviews before. It's like, hey, I, one of the challenges I think of our show is, I mean, when you make a sermon, when you're doing your church work, think about it. If someone were to come around 300 years later, would there be something? You're not preaching it for a future audience, but are you preaching truth with such passionate love that it would be even worth looking at? That's something I try to remind myself in my own walk. Yeah, very cool. Well, let's get into the, the benefits of what you guys are doing. So... You talk about and, and outline three benefits of involving old historic sermons from dead guys in, in someone's spiritual journey, in someone's uh, faith walk. What are those benefits? Why should anybody care or be excited about revived thoughts and the work you guys are doing? Sure. sure. I mean, and there's, there's so many benefits. Um... When you really start to think about it, the thing that that I really enjoy is just the, I mean, people get kind of stuck in their bubble of how they look at theology. You know, we're all here, and especially in this day and age, the past, you know, 50 years where we have such technological advances. We've had radios, we've had televisions, we now have the internet, we're podcasts, and, and everything's being shared and everything. The world is so small now in some ways that theological bubble has kind of also shrinked with it to where we're all kind of in an echo chamber. We're all kind of preaching this. And, and don't get me wrong. I, Troy and I love listening to modern day preachers. A lot of our podcast feed is made up of our favorite uh, sermons from, from modern day churches that we like to listen to as well. Um, but there are things that when you're separated from, from modern day, like people 200 years ago, people 300 years ago, 400 years ago, they look at things differently than we looked at them today. And that's something that you don't get. You don't get a kind of that different perspective on 
the core things in life uh, without kind of taking a step back and, and looking at it from a different angle. And that's something that this show uh, hopefully helps, helps people see is kind of different ways about looking at the things that w- humanity's always been looking at throughout the years. Yeah, it blows our it blows my mind how I mean you can take a sermon from five hundred years ago and if you didn't know that it was preached by John Calvin, if I just read you know, I updated it like I do and just read it to you, you would honestly have no reason to believe it wasn't being preached at the church down the road. It's the same stuff where he's saying, You guys don't take the faith seriously, you guys don't read your Bible, you know, we need to be serious about spreading the love of Christ. Those core things didn't change, but the perspective of somebody from five hundred and fifty years ago in Germany or something like that they do you know maybe they lived through a plague or a war or maybe they've seen their you know multiple children die like george Mueller and hudson taylor and these their lives were they had suffering in ways that we can't imagine most of the time they we know that they became great men because they lived their life there's no scandal with them they're already gone there's not going to be a oh you know what he walked away from he's done his time is over but we can still learn from them and again there's just when you're a missionary in China in the 1800s, like Hudson Taylor, you have a different perspective and you've seen things that people in 21st century America, they can, they're just not going to be able to relate to be able to not relate to it. They're not gonna be able to have that experience. So if we can learn from them, it's, it's just a great benefit. So you'd recommend this to guys who, and ladies who want to grow spiritually. That's exactly who should be listening to it. <laughs> Coming back to that. Yeah, yeah. Spiritual growth is is a huge one. The, the things that these people are talking about are are just as relevant in our lives as they were back then. They mm-hmm. they really do I mean, truth is timeless. The 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 truths that are being preached in the Bible and communicating the Bible are just as applicable to us as they are back then. And I will say too, if you're in ministry and you're a pastor, I can't think of a better um a yeah, better teacher for you than a Charles Spurgeon or a Jonathan Edwards. And you want to be a great speaker? Why don't you go to history's top dogs and see what they were doing? Um, I have a feeling that will that will encourage you in the way you preach and the way you teach. Yeah, that's that's cool. You know, um, it, I just thought of, um, I believe Mark Dever, who's a pastor at Capitol Hill Baptist in um, Washington D.C. I he's got this. He does these nights where he will read an old sermon and I can't remember who it is. A buddy of mine was telling me about this, but he'll literally just stand up and just read. Um, man, I'm going to remember as soon as I get off with you guys, <laughs> I get off the podcast, but uh, yeah. And it, 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 for the same thing, it's like, you know, this, this old preacher has something to say to us today um, in our, even in our modern context, even though it was written for a congregation years ago. And so, you know, what, are, what do you think are some of those biggest lessons that we can learn from historical Christianity? Well, here's an example. Um, Charles Spurgeon is known, uh, he was a part of that revival movement where 5,000 5, people came to his church at a time when they didn't have air conditioners, they didn't have cars, and they didn't have lighting, and they didn't have a speaker system. He, he didn't have nice TVs. There was no electric guitar, none of that stuff, but he's getting them in there to the point that they're crowding around outside, right? And he's having... Um, people like D.L. Moody and all these other guys kind of come in. And he come had smoke history. machines, though, didn't, didn't yeah, they have yeah. smoke machines? Well, I mean, you got to have and lasers, that, obviously. I mean, <laughs> but he didn't have any of that stuff. And yet, and there's no online social media. There's not going to be Facebook buzz about it, but he's getting them in the door. And he has a sermon that we're going to have out here in a bit on revival. And he has this amazing line where he just kind of looks at his congregation and just goes, there are so many people claiming to be Christians but I know you guys aren't Christians and you know how I know you aren't Christians because when I pick up the newspaper, I read about all this crime in London. And I think to myself, if all of you were Christians, we wouldn't have so much crime in London, would we? So why don't we answer that question? Could you imagine (laughs) being in a church and seeing your pastor do that? I mean, these people just say things, but it's true. You think about it, you're like, that is true though. I mean, like if we're a Christian nation, like the United States of America, sometimes we'll say, why do we have such high levels of in moments like that ways of preaching a lack of fear like we live in an era where sound clips of us can be quickly transferred out these guys weren't worried about that they really didn't care if these clips were taken of them so you can connect to history in that way but another thing too in connecting to history is that you realize the more you study that you are a small sliver of a long church 
history of great preachers and great teachers and great men and great women doing these amazing things throughout the history. And you suddenly realize like, you know, when I read the news and I get involved in my life, I think, oh my gosh, the pressure is up and the church is so divided and all these different things. But then when I take a step back and I listen to Moody and Spurgeon, I see Hugh Latimer being burned at the stake and I suddenly go, you know, actually we're doing pretty good right now. <laughs> Our faith is actually living in kind of a cushy moment, if anything. And even the, and we could be doing a lot worse than we are. And that's actually an apologetic side of this too, is realizing how consistent our faith I was reading a sermon by Origen, who would have probably preached this like at the end of the second century. And it is a sermon that in many ways could be transferred to today. And you really wouldn't notice a lot of the key differences. That's an 1800-year-old sermon. And yet our preachers and teachers have been consistent in preaching the word and exegetically like he did for that long. That's really encouraging to me to think that I am a part of like, this is not something that's new or wasn't something that was discovered in the Reformation. This is something that's been going on since, I mean, for a very long time. (laughs) Oh man, that's very encouraging to see that, to think that we believe the same things as, you know, you mentioned Chrysostom a couple of times. Man, that's, that's the enduring nature of, and I love how you say truth is timeless. You know, it's, it's so true. So we can learn a lot. We can, we can experience camaraderie with guys from the past, yeah. guys and gals yeah. from the past. And yet we also, uh, it can challenge ourselves living in our modern context. And so just to sort of recap for our listeners, we talked about spiritual growth. We talked about um, getting rooted in historical Christianity. But then you mentioned another benefit as well, which is challenging shallowness. And, uh, you know, I got to say that it feels a little bit like a shot across the bow of uh, modern contemporary evangelicalism. Tell us about what, what do you mean challenging shallowness? You know, are you are you uh, are you calling somebody out there or, or what, are you, what are you trying to help us avoid here? You know, like Joel said, we do not, I mean, we have, we have preachers in our podcast. We think that there are lots of really great modern preachers of modern podcasts and modern talk shows. So we are in no way trying to replace them. We think we're a great compliment to what they're doing, but I will say there is some truth that I look around and I look at what we kind of talk about and think about. And I go, I do sometimes ask myself, I said, do, like I said, will what we're doing be worth saving 200 years from now is what we're preaching and teaching actually important or do we like to cave to the culture because we've done 36 or so sermons plus a bunch of episodes in the works not hard i don't think hardly one of them has been preached by a guy who just kind of gave in to what the world was doing at the time no the guys who stand out the historically best sermons preachers the men who do these amazing works and see these amazing reformations or revivals and stuff are the guys who just go out swinging the entire time, who never once cave, who are willing to just sit there and say things like Charles Spurgeon did to his congregation, which is like, you guys are bad and we need to do better. And they do that constantly. They rip on their congregation. And yet the, the, the response is people are moved by the word of God and they're convicted. And I'm convicted here reading their sermons 200, 300 years later. And I go, wow, I hope, and you know, I hope and pray that we can, we can learn to preach sometimes with that boldness because I think we do get a little bit scared and and not all preachers. Obviously there are lots of amazing men and women of God who are doing it, but I just, I hope and pray that we can get kind of that boldness that a lot of these guys in history had and they weren't. And two, we talk about it too. You look at their stories, look at their lives. A lot of them lost kids. A lot of them suffered. Several of them were in jail multiple times. And yet they didn't, as soon as they were let back out of jail, they were back at it again. I mean, we mentioned Dietrich Bonhoeffer. That guy left, got kicked out of Germany, came back to Germany, got kicked back out of Germany. At that point, I'd have been like, I did my part, God. Like, I'm good. And he went back into Germany again. John Bunyan was sent to jail and was basically said, if you'll just promise to stop preaching or just kind of go somewhere else, we'll let you go, please. And he was like, the thing is, if you let me out of jail, I'll just be back here tomorrow. So what's the purpose? Incredible. So, so you guys are, are doing this work. You're, you're posting these sermons. You're bringing them back to life. I mean, reviving the name. The name says it all. Revived thoughts. Um, what do you say to someone who says, all right, uh, look, I'm glad that those sermons were impactful for, for that day, but – 
honestly, the idea of dragging up these old sermons, the old dusty old sermons. I mean, quite honestly, I'm, I mean, we've got current events, man. We've got impeachment that's happening as we record this, right? We've got, you know, there's the, the, whatever scandals breaking out of my own church, not in my personal church, but you understand people, you know, look, my, I'm trying to get my kids to, uh, to karate. Like I, I don't need to hear some dusty old sermon from John Chrysostom, whoever that is. You know, I, I want to, I want something relevant, something current. I'm not really interested in whether or not it's, it's been around for 1800 years. I want something that's relevant to today. What do you say to somebody who's, who's looking for that, the cutting edge stuff, as opposed to the dry, dusty old uh, sermons from yesteryear. Yeah, I mean, and I, I kind of, I feel like touched on this a little bit earlier, but as far as just, we we need to kind of take a step back from modern culture sometimes. We, we all are kind of in the same boat. We all are dealing with current issues. We all live in this age where we're constantly talking to each other. We're constantly, you know, feeding into each other's social network. Everybody always is kind of on the same page with whatever's going on, whatever current event. Um, and those opinions are also shared. So when people are upset about something, it's, it's shared through social media and everyone's kind of has on the same page as far as what they feel about certain things or uh, how they feed into each other in that way. Taking a step back from that kind of feedback loop, that, that bubble of reality that we currently live in is incredibly refreshing sometimes to see how someone else in a different era maybe approached even similar topics or similar uh, themes in life uh, in ways that we wouldn't necessarily think about approaching them in today's day and age. It is, it is like, it is, it's refreshing sometimes to see. And you could say the same thing. You could take the same argument and say, well, why do I need to read the Bible? It's just old people's opinions 2000 years ago. Right. But we know that the truth of the Bible, God's word speaks through God's word. And we know these sermons are definitely not God's word, but there is truth in them that is being preached that are through some of God's best men like Charles Spurgeon and Martin Luther and some of the George, you know, George Whitfield and these great guys. And so it's like, yeah, you know, this, we definitely don't think we're the Bible, but I will say these are some of the best preachers that ever lived. If you don't think they have something to speak to you, I understand. Plus I will say this too, Christians, we've been chasing the new ideas and the most current thoughts and we listen to the news and we're on top of that. I don't know that things are getting better. Maybe the better idea would be to go back to the tra some traditions and truths and rethink it and go, Hey, let's, Let's take a look at how they were doing it back then. Maybe we're missing something. Love it. Um, all right. I want to hit you guys with another objection because you mentioned Whitfield. And here's why I want to bring up Whitfield. And it, I, you could have said Jonathan Edwards. Uh, you, you could have said, um, oh, man, <laughs> depending on what region and, and what era of history you're talking about, you could have said uh, any, any number of these guys. Right. But – what do you do? Because you mentioned someone earlier, or you mentioned earlier, you said, well, these guys have stood the test of time. You said something to the effect that they didn't have major scandals. Okay, but there were things that were not necessarily scandalous in history, in historical times, that nowadays we would say, wow, that's, that's pretty scandalous. You know, so, I, so let's talk about Whitfield or Jonathan Edwards. And some of these guys were involved with, uh, behaviors, institutions that we nowadays, we look back and we say, man, how did you miss that? And of course, I'm, I'm speaking specifically of the institution of slavery, race-based, ethnic-based slavery. So what do you do when you come to a guy like Whitfield, who was so instrumental and impactful, amazing preacher, led countless thousands to faith in Christ. But then you look at the, the the personal views that they held about slavery and and uh, African Americans and you go oof you know so so where's the uh, I don't want to say where's the justification but how do you handle that as guys who are bringing these these men back to life in certain ways how do you how do you wrestle with some of the darker aspects or the the blind spots that some of them may have had and, and you know, I know we could get into a theological discussion of 
of slavery and things, but I guess I'm just thinking no, like, I'm, I think it's pretty easy. Actually, this is a, not, you, you, know, you may think it's a tough one, but this is actually a home run. Uh, <laughs> this is the toughest man. one I got. Come on, man. I'm no, going to come man, up with something this, else now. This is the, this, here's the quick answer for me. It's like, wow, God used this guy with really backwards thinking to save thousands of people for Jesus Christ. And those people are in heaven today. Thanks to the work of George Whitfield. If he can use backward thinkers like them, maybe he can even use me, right? Like God can use <laughs> anybody. He can use Martin Luther who, right. you know, there all those guys didn't have the greatest view on cemetery on uh, Jews, did they? If we threw every single backwards person out, we would not only throw out every every single person in history, but eventually we throw out ourselves. Because guess what? A hundred, two hundred years from now, there are going to be people going, "Can you believe twenty first century Christians in America didn't see?" x y and z and they just went to church and they preached because you know what we're not we tell people in our episodes we say hey look we know we got to the george whitfield we said by the way it's important that you know this aspect of him he helped sure. get slavery into georgia it's not pretty right. but it is there and, we, and that's something i mean we never want to repaint history or, or hide history and that's yeah. something we want to make very clear in our in our historical sections is we want all the facts to be out there and we want you to know these things we don't want to be accused of of trying to make these seem these men seem better or worse than they were, um, we want you to know the facts and and make those observations yourself. Um, they're men, and that's just the thing. Like men, err. Uh, they misunderstand things. They have incorrect viewpoints on things. Uh, and as long as there's that human element involved, um, there's going to be things that they mess up and they get wrong. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean the Lord can't use them to communicate some, some great truths. And, you know, specifically Whitfield was, uh, quoted by Spurgeon in a sermon that I, that I was working on. And he specifically was like, I can't believe the great preaching of Spurgeon. It was at, or of Whitfield. It's actually quite ironic because in the sermons, Spurgeon basically goes, who will be the next Whitfield? We don't have one. And the irony of course, is he would end up being the next, you know, big mega preacher of his era. And he didn't even realize that as he was saying it. But the thing is like, yeah, Whitfield had this big flaw. You know, Martin Luther has his big flaws. These guys do have these flaws, but what comfort to us, and going back to Spurgeon too, you know, Whitfield's big flaw was that he had this racism, you know, he believed people could be owned and used. Spurgeon struggled with depression. He would literally struggle to get out of bed, and he felt like at times he was worthless and dust. And yet, look at how God used his voice, still uses his voice today. You know, even if you don't listen to our sermons, his quotes and his books are out there, right? Like, all of these men suffered or struggled in some area. And I think all of us do too. And so it is a real great comfort to look to these guys and go, I'm glad that I don't have to be perfect. Hudson Taylor could be known sometimes as kind of a tyrant and could be a little bit too tough on the field. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he had some weird stuff going on. All of these guys had weird stuff going on. And I'm, I look at that and I go, man, I'm really glad I don't have to be perfect. Man. And, and, you know, um, it's cool too. Scripture lays down a framework for that. Uh, I, I, do you guys have kids? I have two. I don't have any quite yet. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, my, my kids, one of their favorite questions to ask me is, as we're reading the Bible, so is this person good or bad? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, you know, we get to somebody like Solomon. <laughs> it's like, is Solomon good or bad? It's kind of like, well... Solomon's probably one of the two. Solomon and Saul. Because, I mean, Saul, obviously, bad guy trying to kill King David. But, man, I really wrestle with hating him because i yeah. can kind of relate to him a little bit like he really he, it was rough i i feel very i feel a lot of pity for saul i guess totally yeah and that's that's something that we have in biblical christianity that you know for example islam does not have i i mm. um recently had a conversation with a muslim teacher and you know she she could not believe that david would commit adultery or that uh abraham tried to essentially traffic his own wife or that Jonah really lost faith um, because for her, the highest moral paradigm is a human being because she doesn't believe that Jesus is God. Mm -hmm. And so for us, you know, all of these, all of the men God uses and the women that God uses are, we recognize that they're imperfect because yeah. there's only one who's ever been perfect. And that's where we put our faith in him. And I think, as you guys are reviving these sermons, that's got to be encouraging to see, wow, Whitfield wasn't perfect, but he trusted in Christ. Spurgeon wasn't perfect. He had depression, but he trusted in Christ. That's the same Jesus that I trust in. 
yeah, yeah. exactly and, and not to say that a depression is a sin or anything but i'm just saying no like, no right pause uh because we'll, we'll, we'll throw it down he was smoking a little too much on spurgeon that's what i'll get him for. well now <laughs> come on now let's not uh you know uh yeah okay listen oh dl moody ate a little too much we'll say that he was known for being a big hefty american <laughs> yes that's true well hey everything is permissible but not everything is beneficial like there we go. Hey, <laughs> double cheeseburger might be permissible right. but you know maybe i should have a salad one of these times yes um all right guys as we as we wrap this up uh start to put a bow on this you know feel free to let us uh let my listeners know how can folks get in touch with you and then feel free to promote any projects you guys are currently working on? Oh man. Uh, you guys can find us on any uh, podcasting application that you listen to. Uh, uh, Apple podcast, Spotify um, podcast, out of cast box, wherever you're at, we're at, we're going to be there and you can listen to us there. You can also um, find us Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You can, you follow us. We put out quotes from the show. We put out episodes, little interesting facts. We've um, pictures from places that are related to that maybe we've been to. All kinds of little things like that end up on those places. And uh, obviously, we have a website, revivethoughts.com. Um, you can listen to the episodes. or You can read the transcripts and sermons, too. And if you are interested in being a speaker on our show, if you say, hey, I would love to preach a sermon for the Revive Thought Show, a lot of our speakers do come from listeners either themselves or recommending you know, a pastor or someone they know that they think would be a good voice for us. Uh, feel free to email us at revivethoughts at gmail.com and we'd love to start a dialogue with you. Yeah, those are the main, those are the main big things out there. Just come check us out. Uh, listen to a couple of our episodes. People love to start with Spurgeon and JC Ryle and we say, hey, those are great places Bonhoeffer, to go. that's my recommendation. Go, <laughs> go find the, there's two Bonhoeffer episodes out right now. They're my favorite. Uh, our narrator on that one, Dustin Garrett, did an incredible job. Yeah, so just go find a couple, give them a few, few click-throughs and uh, see what you think. We, I, Literally, I would say two or three, maybe more times a week, we'll get an email from people who are just like, I didn't know, I never even thought about this. And now you're like, you're changing my world. Like I am being blown away by all this. Very cool. Well, let me just say what you guys are doing is so cool. And the impact that you're having on, and, and the potential for, uh, I know you don't call yourselves a ministry, but for it, it truly, if you think about ministry as a service to God's people, you know, bringing these voices back to life, bringing these men back to life and the, the background information that you guys share and post is, uh, you know, I got my undergrad in history. So, and I'm, I'm a little bit of a history buff, but it's just so cool to find out this bi biographical information and then to hear these sermons being preached is, um, you know, I, I can't help but think that you yourselves are having a, an impact that will last and will benefit the church for who knows how long. So I want to just give you guys kudos and, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad you guys took the time to come on the Think Podcast. Um, I do hope that my listeners will um, connect with you guys, go to your website, and just begin to, if nothing else, just start to dip your toe into the historical waters of these old sermons and these old preachers. And, um, you know, I just, I, I think you guys, you can only go up. Uh, what you're doing is just really, really cool. It can only, it can only get better. It can only get more richer and, and deeper. So um, thank you guys for what you're doing. Thanks for coming on the think podcast. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, we really appreciate it. And it was really fun. So to connect with the think podcast and the think institute just go to the think.institute you can get all of our podcasts and articles and resources there we've got apologetics resources biblical worldview and evangelism resources as well as slideshow presentations on how to share the gospel with muslims and those who believe differently than you do um if you want to connect with us on social media i hope that you do on twitter we are at think inst on facebook and instagram at the Think Institute. Send me an email with any question, comment, concerns, or conundrums or complaints at thethink.institute at gmail.com. And this is not goodbye. This is just a little pit stop along the way of your spiritual journey. And what I hope is that you have the opportunity over this next week to put something that you just heard into practice. And uh, Troy and Joel are doing great work. I really do hope that you guys can connect with them. Uh, connect with us as well. And if you haven't done so yet, 
go ahead and leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Write us a short review. That really does help to commend us to others who might be interested in the kind of content that we're putting out there. So if it's beneficial to you, share the wealth. And then while you're at it, go subscribe to Revived Thoughts on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player, but leave them a five-star review as well because it really does help us podcasters out and uh, helps get the word out. And, and if you don't do it, who else is going to do it? So thank you for listening. That's all we have for you now. Until next time, I hope it made you think. <laughs>